Hey folks, it's Jim. Morning, Jim. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Robert? Doing well, doing well. Just pulling up the notes here. Yeah, I was just updating myself. A uh, few items we can discuss. So by the way, Robert, did you get the email on the um, the SIG membership? Uh, I think uh, Christoph mentioned that you probably received an email you have to accept. And that was the last step. OK, let me, let me check. Sorry, I've got <laughs> so many inboxes. And <laughs> uh, I've got tons of SIG stuff. Yeah, so this would be from, I guess, uh, I guess it would be from GitHub to join the group. Anyway, carry on, I'll, I'll keep looking here. Okay. Hey, Jim, can you hear me? This is Jaya. Hey, Jaya, how are you? Good. I actually had one agenda topic I wanted to bring up today. Okay. Do you have access to the doc to add it or? Yeah, let me do that. Yeah, okay. Okay, I added it. All right. And Jim, can you send the post the link of the doc in the chat, please? Sure, it should be in the meeting invite, but let me add it on the Slack as well. Yeah, and I guess our first topic uh, we can talk about is this actually related to that and just the organization of the group, et cetera. So maybe let's kick things off. I think we're almost at five past and we have you know uh, quite a few people on already. So hi everyone, this is Jim uh, and let's get started with our um, work group meeting. So one of the first topics I want to discuss, this is something Robert and I were also discussing offline and trying to figure out what's the best way to coordinate things. Uh, so the, you know, we have been, of course, working, um, you know, with this group, with uh, organizers like Erica and Harvard in the past, but it seems like they have, um, you know, moved on to other responsibilities or are not very active with the group, at least at this point. So, you know, I reached out to get some help from our TOC liaison, um, you know, and uh, to see what can be done. So they're gonna also find out and reach out and, you know, see uh, if there's a way we can get access to the videos. So apparently each work group should have their own kind of video channel, um, which helps us with the calendaring and things like that. And even then updating meeting invites, et cetera, would be a lot easier uh, for us, right? So in, in the next few weeks, we'll get some of those things sorted out. So that way we just have um, a good path moving forward. Um, and, you know, we'll also, uh, like, I guess,
guess it's too late for KubeCon EU, but maybe in the KubeCon US, uh, you know, we should plan on doing a session update, talk about some of the projects we're doing, you know, in terms of uh, the policy report CRD, uh, as well as like other projects we might start or initiate, you know, by then. There's a lot going on, of course, with, you know, pod security policies uh, being marked for deprecation with, you know, this discussions around policy engines uh, and other policy tools in general. So I think there's a lot of good things we can say uh, and, uh, you know, talk about and also get feedback from the community. Um, so that's the, you know, idea, Ben. Let me know if there's any thoughts, um, you know, other things we want to do. Uh, we can also use this as an opportunity to solicit interest from other six and kind of revamp a little bit of the agenda for the working group and what we see we want to do in the next 12 to 18 months um, in terms of uh, things to accomplish. Agreed, agreed. So I guess one foundational question, um, because I think Howard had started this as the Kubernetes policy and then we kind of overlapped. We were, are currently housed under the CNCF SIG security as a subgroup of some sort. So e even I'm unclear as to you know where where we what hierarchy, right. <laughs> where do we want to be? Where are we? Where should we be? So I'm. And I think we can yeah get feedback and it's you know we can propose what we feel makes the most sense right. Um, but it's a good question. Uh, I was confused. Sorry, go ahead. As a quick straw man, do, do folks, are, are folks here coming because it's a Kubernetes specific group or are we coming because it's CNCF all inclusive and it could span, you know, everything from, you know, Istio to Cloud Custodian to OPA to Caverno to everything outside of just Kubernetes. Yeah, I think, uh, Jay, this is Jay talking. And I think from my perspective, I think, you know, uh, I'm passionate about uh, policy-based governance across the stack, right? So Kubernetes is definitely one piece of the puzzle, but I think we need to apply this uh, throughout. Um, but, so I would say my primary interest is Kubernetes, but uh, it goes beyond that. That's helpful. I would, I would echo that. This is Raj. I would echo that. Very similar. I come at this more from a compliance perspective, but primarily in Kubernetes and other systems. Thank you, Raj. Yeah, and I totally agree. I think, you know, obviously Kubernetes is not the end all place. Um, although having said that, I think for projects, it seems like the natural place to start and then kind of widen the scope, right? So, but we do want to make sure we cover other systems like service meshes. And in fact, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you have seen or read or heard of the cloud native security white paper. We can use that as a framework to some degree to organize also, um, you know, how policies impact different parts of the cloud native stack. Yeah, the other thing I also wanted to highlight is I know this group is under the uh, SIG security. Uh, from my perspective, right, policies or security policies obviously are very important, but uh, policies are also relevant for resiliency and other software engineering aspects, right? So um, I think um, at least that's the way you know we are approaching it, right? Because uh, when you talk about standards, right, I think it's. Uh, when uh, a right. customer wants to run run their cloud to meet standards, they're looking standards across the board, right? But you know, I'm not uh, I'm not particular on where actually this all fits in. I don't think it's you know as long as the work gets done, right? Um, I'm 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 not going to insist it has to be in one org versus the other org. I think six security is fine because. Most customers, I think security is the first one they would apply this to anyway, so. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and one interesting thing which wasn't, and so the Kubernetes SIG security is fairly new and this, I, I didn't even realize there were two SIG securities uh, until 
you know, I saw the Kubernetes SIG security and then there was a CNCF SIG security. And I think Robert in the past, you were always mentioning SIG security referring to the CNCF one and I could never find it on the Kubernetes Slack, right? And um, so I think that uh, was confusing for me in the beginning, but uh, I understand of course there's two different charters now and of what they're doing and they collaborate with each other. So that all makes sense, but yeah, we can decide either based on a, so from certainly from the working group perspective, seems like a broader charter makes sense from a per project point of view, we can decide, you know, whether we start with the Kubernetes scope and then add on other tooling and other support uh, or, you know, just uh, start with the broader scope in some cases. Okay, and, and we don't have to get in the weeds, but maybe we, we can happy to take it on the Slack, but I think from a governance perspective, I guess, it seems like we're using the Kubernetes, GitHub and repo, right? but that we're somehow in the CNCF governance framework. So I guess I, I'm just, I'm confused as to like, who are we? Right. <laughs> who are we supposed to report status to? Who are we, who are we ultimately? Yeah. But I, I mean, we can take that offline. That's fine. I, yeah, I think there was I the consensus that the scope needs to be bigger than pollen, uh, Kubernetes, but rooted in Kubernetes as a practical matter. So I think we're all on the same same page. There. Yep, makes sense. Yeah, and I believe this in our at least the initial charter when Harvard and team started the group. You know, they had uh, listed all of these six as stakeholders. So architecture, auth, uh, multi-cluster, network, node, scheduling, and storage. So I'm assuming there was some discussion with all of these SIGs. Um, interestingly, security is not listed here, uh, which, you know, obviously we've been working closely with SIG, SIG auth and SIG security. So yeah, so anyways, we, we, can, we can revisit this, you know, with guidance from so Christoph is our, um, you know, steering committee liaison, and he, he'll help us get some of these things sorted out. Well, and this is, you know, this is a anecdotal, but in discussions with you know folks like Custodian, you know, they primarily don't see themselves as a compliance tool. So they would, they would be more around policy, in terms of managing resources, right? Like maybe that's okay. cost, maybe that's just visibility. So. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think security is just a part of it. And uh, right. early on, we did talk about things about resource policies and things like that. So that said, from a practical perspective, um, if you, you know, I think the audience that's used to dealing with security policy is the audience that gets it first, if you will. Right. Okay. All right. So more to, more to come and more to happen. And I think, you know, if we can drum up some interest from other groups on some of these projects, then at some point we'll have, you know, maybe we just need to have some, uh, I don't know the full process, but Christoph will again tell us so that I think there's a way to have like elections or votes for new organizers um, based on, and we should, you know, uh, reach out. I think there's other folks interested in some of the OSCAL work and the white paper works so if we advertise the projects based on that we'll get you know um so i think for each project we want somebody to lead that and then we want organizers for the group who can do the overall um sig collaboration and liaison and all of that right so we'll have to um get that sort of roster in place at the right time Okay, um, so we'll continue working on that and I'll update you know, everyone as we find out more and just feel free to reach out if there's any other ideas, et cetera. Um, the next item here is on the uh, CRD. So where we are is you know, right now, there's a few PR spending and we were stuck because we had nobody to be able to review and uh, merge these PRs, but now Robert uh, has access. And so Anka, I took all of the work that you did and you know, resubmitted that on the Golang types. So that's in this PR. I did have a few questions, but we can discuss those on Slack or if we can come back to that if we have more time. So like, like I had posted some in 
uh, in the GitHub issue itself. So maybe if you can take a look at that and add in your thoughts. But the, if we can get this PR merged, I think then we have all of the, you know, the work that you did to, uh, for um, aligning this with OSCAL, yeah. at least would be merged. Yeah, I, I realized uh, we, we miss one thing. So um, yes, we've done the mapping. I have all also to check against the schema if we have all the required data. So if we use okay. the data to generate something and if we do not have all the required data, uh, we will fail the the validation and right we cannot use the the oscal object so i will have i have that to do as well okay. to make sure that uh, we don't need to add anything on your side to to have a complete validating uh okay all right so yeah just take a look at the um in the changes here see if there's anything else or any other updates we need and then we can go ahead and get this merged uh, and regenerate the HTML file for the schema. Okay. The, the few other PRs that are pending, we need to decide. So there were some comments on the, uh, on the document about adding like time fields and adding other fields for, um, I, I believe it was like resolution and things like that. So we need to decide if we need those or we don't. Uh, I think time, of course, like when something was reported, how often it occurs, when it was last seen, that is required. But these others, um, I'm not sure if they are required and how we would use, but those are the other two PRs uh, that are pending, which we have to decide if we accept them or not and uh, what we want in the CRD versus what can go into the unstructured data. Yeah, I think the uh, for the last scene, the latest discussion, uh, and I, I, yeah, I didn't get a chance to go and look wh where it took off from. Uh, we agreed with the person that was on that task that we need, uh, you know, last scene is like a you know a first degree type of information, and we need a, a second degree, right? Because I can have something that oscillates. And the actual last scene is not helpful because mm -hmm. I'm just oscillating. And so to to move to move more in terms of you know uh, uh, trend or uh, an, an, another um, measure that that right. would be uh, more helpful, right? To uh, to reflect the long term information because I think the idea of last scene is to help with with that trend, with that, you know, inform the user this is happening for a while and to make sure we don't lose it, right? Right. Yeah, so would the combination of first scene, last scene and occurrences be enough to capture that or do we need something more? And what would that be is something we need to decide, right? So if I have something that oscillates, right, I'll have a first scene, last scene and occurrences one, 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 right? So yeah, so, so, um, so this would be a timestamp first scene, last scene would be dates like or epoch times. Um, and this would be the number of occurrences. So it would increment. I think we're just saying just have a timestamp on, on, uh, I guess the, the question is, do we just want the last timestamp? I think it would be important to know when it was first seen as well. And then, so first seen timestamp, last seen time span, and how many times in that, you know, has it been seen is the three things, right? Uh, that was suggested. The other way is of course of doing it as like, I guess start and end is also first and last or, um, so anyways, let's think about that. We don't have to decide now, but we need some time information in each of the result entries, right? And these three, to me, at least seem to capture what would be required. It's, you know, and then other systems can periodically scrape this and add trending and things like that, right? Yeah, I think uh, um, uh, when we have something that oscillates, right? Let's say that it changes within the hour and comes back and forth. Uh, and if I'm doing this over one week, um, my last scene, first scene will be from the last hour because that's when it actually changed to the new value, right? So I, I lose that the, the, the fact that this I have a, an issue there for a week now 
because no, the I first guess... scene will not mutate. That would be the first time it was reported. That's the intent. Uh, the, that condition, whenever the first time it occurred, the last scene would be from the hour. So last hour, but the first scene would be a week ago and the occurrences would be how many times it happened in that okay. interval. So I have control A and it switches between false and true, false and true, right? And, um, and you are saying that the first time it becomes false, I'll have, that would be my first date, right? And within the next hour, it's cha it changes to true. So okay, yeah, I, still... I see what you mean. So it's flipped now to true. So that's why the first scene was cleared. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think maybe, I'm not sure, you know, I have seen a, 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 a type of, of um, KPIs like within the 14 days, right? We can, we can take and say, you know, how many times that occurred within the 14 days? Right. So, but that, that would be if an external system were, you know, polling and putting this data like through Prometheus or something, again, like the intent here would be to capture the current, but then let the history be, you know, stored in some external system in a histogram or other metric like you're suggesting. Would that work? Yeah, that, that's what I try to, I think we try to achieve here. We do not have historical data when I right. see just a result. We don't keep historical data. Historical data would keep, be kept on some logging tool, right? Monitoring tool. Right. And how much do I want to capture within a given sample, right? That, that's that's right. the question. Right. Right, so- Yeah, now of course, if this period is not granular enough, then yes, it, some history could be lost if it flips too quickly. But you know, if typically you're, we're talking about minutes, not like milliseconds or anything like that. So yeah. So what I would like as a as a as an admin is is to have this in the summary. So when I have the summary, or you know, uh, or, or maybe even that that uh, occurrence, right? That it it tells me uh, uh, that that uh, false around how many times it it happened, right? In in, in the past. Uh, 14 days, not since the last occurrence, because if things flip, I lose that. That that was right. the right. But it, then then aren't we merging in the history again? And you know, is it is 14 days enough? It should it be 30 days? Should it be one year? Um, so yeah, I think 14 days is more than enough, right? Because we are looking at the spectrum to be able to fix something. Maybe even maybe 48 hours is enough, or you know, one week. Um, I've seen this 14 as kind of a magic number for many things. That's why I'm, I'm coming up with okay. that. And if I really want to look for a year, I'm not going to look at the current sample. I really go back to my logging system to whatever, you know, uh, Prometheus and look for the, you know, evolution of, of, that, of that control value over the year. I'm not expecting this with one sample of data. Hi, Jim and Anka. Um, I do have to drop in five minutes, but... Um, okay. One yeah, thing no, I, you... I wanted to see, right, uh, one agenda item I added, I don't think we'll get to it today. Mm -hmm. but, uh, one of the things I want to kind of focus on is, um, you know, we have all these various policy engines, right? So we have Gatekeeper Opa and then we have Kiveno. And I wanted to see how we can at least create some positioning or, you know, mm -hmm. how to bring these together, right? So because... Uh, from our perspective within Red Hat, we are uh, we have picked up Gatekeeper Opa and we are we have incorporated it into our offering and we want to we are going to support it, et cetera, right? And then I, uh, Jim, you took us through the QA now, right? So now I'm kind of saying, you know, how does that uh, relate to this, right? So um, also I wanted to share um, how our uh, policy framework, which we are open sourcing, is uh, integrating with all these different uh, engines. And by the way, we have created a policy for QNO now. Okay. Um, so so I, th I think, um, so can we tee that up as one of the topics um, maybe in the next call? Sure, yeah, definitely. And we can you know discuss it early or if you even wanna have a, you know, and then maybe there's a natural sort of segue into this, uh, one of the things that was proposed was having like a white paper with um, some positioning document okay. on policy Good. reporting and policy tools. Yeah, maybe that's uh, this might belong in that. Yep. 
And, and so just said, so for historical context, uh, Jim, I think you may recall this, but when we first started talking about the policy report, it was actually a compromise position from, from starting right. with, um, this conversation yes. about that we absolutely you know, didn't want to boil the ocean and try to spec what a policy engine interface mm -hmm. or, or specification should look like without okay. a little bit more uh, community involvement. And we decided the first way to do that was to kind of define the output. Yeah. And then we could maybe circle back around and look at the, you know, the input, if you will. Right. So. But I, I like this, um, this uh, white paper, right? So maybe the white paper can, we can specify the overall building blocks of the policy architecture and the policy report becomes one of right. the pieces, right? right? And then I think, I think I'd love to contribute to, to that one. Okay, cool. Um, maybe we can uh, tee this up in uh, the next call, which is in a couple of weeks. Um, okay. If, if you're interested, I, I know you've got to drop it. I'd be happy to take that off as kind of, we could do that as a Slack. I think there's probably some momentum that we can build over the next uh, couple of weeks. Intro. Yeah. So, yeah, so definitely, yeah. you know, let's, you know, go through what I started capturing in the white paper and we could even collaborate. This is just more intended to be a working document at this point to see okay. what do we want? What is the scope of the white paper? Because again, if we make it too large, it'll just take longer. Right. Uh, how do we dovetail into the cloud native security white paper? And we can use, they've actually come up with a really nice process and other things to do this. So we, it would be good to read up on it and decide what we want to do. Uh, and then we can go back to the six securities, both of them and uh, you know share the proposal, get some more feedback and then start working on the sections. But really the first question is like the audience and the scope of the white paper itself. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll definitely take a look at the white paper and like Robert, you said, um, I will go in and uh, put my thoughts down there also. That'll be great. I'm thinking okay. maybe we make use of the every other week to, to do a Slack session that uh, we could do more of a working session and actually go yeah. through the work. Sounds, sounds great. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Shaya. All right. Um, yeah, so, and Anka, we can kind of discuss this more offline too. My, my only concern with, you know, again, adding in any form of history is, uh, you know, we have in the past tried to keep the report just to current information. So certainly if there's an in-cluster Prometheus, et cetera, that could be looking at this every 10 seconds, every minute, uh, picking up these values and then showing any historical occurrences. But uh, you know, my preference would be to keep that out of the policy report CRD. And just because the report itself is only talking about current, current um, you know, violations and current results, it doesn't keep any other history today, right? Right, so I guess, Mike, why do we need any of these fields if we just have a timestamp for the... For when it was reported, that's fair too. Yeah, so then we can just keep a timestamp for when it was reported. The only thing, if if there's a monitoring system that's periodically collecting, um, it won't have you know the number of occurrences in in its collection interval. Right. So that that was the thinking, and it's this is very typical in monitoring systems. You have like a first scene, last scene, and the number. So let's say if the monitoring system is collecting every five minutes, you're just saying that I, yeah, I saw it, you know, in that uh, first in, in a, when it was seen, when it was last seen and occurrences, but I, I'm fine with just keeping a single so timestamp and starting with that. Yeah, you assume that uh, we have the current, the last report, and I override that last report, but I can still use the information from the last report. So I copy the first scene, I sure. I, I update last scene, and I in, increase uh, increment occurrences. That's that's the idea here, right? So I don't, don't have any other support other than that. Yes. So if a policy engine is producing this report, that's exactly what it would do. Yes. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we could just start with it as a single timestamp to say last seen. And I think that one we all, you know, it's definitely going to be need. And then we can add more if, if required. That's good. I, I think, I, yeah, I think it, it makes sense. We, we keep it simple. And uh, uh, typically uh, the monitoring system will have alerts associated with that. So we'll need to have more in-depth 
analytics. So if that uh, um, type of flip that I mentioned occurs, will not be detected, you know, at at the uh, uh, policy location. It will be detected at the right. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I'm, I'm just, I'll type in a comment. Um, so, so we just want last seen then? That's. Yeah, I mean, it's the timestamp of that, this report. This report. So la I, I would keep first seen because last seen is my timestamp, right? My current time of capturing that, right? So, um, last scene if i would be to i would only store first scene right last scene will be replaced with my current time last scene is equivalent to the current time isn't it so maybe we don't call it last scene or first scene just call it timestamp or so timestamp is uh, uh, we don't have timestamp today at all so timestamp no. is is the oh, okay so then we have to have the timestamp right so this is what happens now uh, and uh, of course, we can keep logic for last seen and, and occurrences. That would be additional properties of the of the evidence. That's not a, that's not a problem. Yeah. So we don't have any notion of time in the results, right? That's the. Oh yeah, that's that's. A, that's a, I think it was one of the gaps that you are it were identified. You are right here. Yeah. So just, just that's why I wanted to, to go over all the all the uh, required fields in in OSCAL to make sure we don't miss anything right. else. Timestamp is definitely a required one. <coughs> okay, all right. So let's so just call it timestamp or something else. Yeah, yeah, we can we can call it timestamp. Let me see what you, what we have in OSCAL. Okay. All right. So if you look in the comments there, you will find because I put it in the comment what it's called today. Timestamp collected expired. Uh, with Just call it timestamp. Timestamp time okay. is the value. All right. Perfect. Let's go with that then. Okay. Um, and then yeah, on the other PR, like that's you know we can decide if we want something else, um, like in terms of the resolution or other fields right so we can add those later but okay um and robert yeah maybe once this is done we can yeah, i'll set you as the approver again for the pr and let's see if you can get this uh you know you you'll have to add like the standard lgtm and approved <laughs> labels uh, and then that should uh, allow it to get merged all right um so one other quick update so we have um you know i enrolled in the linux foundation mentorship program and this gets us you know and um a mentee or an intern to work with us for three months and the project that i had proposed was you know uh, taking kubebench and writing an adapter to capture the results and produce the crd so we'll get started on that project starting next week. And you know, if we get Kubebench done, we'll do Falco next. And then we can also discuss other uh, tools uh, as needed. Yeah, so I, I had a, a conversation with Kapil. Um, they're kind of off busy doing more uh, collectors and not particularly engaged in doing it. But that said, I'm, I'm happy to, to propose a PR for them. Um, but okay. as I dug in, it seems for custodian, they'd be more of a consumer rather than a producer of a policy report. Because they're, like I say, their policies are, are less about evaluating, you know, any kind of current activity and more about just imposing a, a set of requirements on resources. Um, and they're, and in particular, their Kubernetes support is pretty uh, minimal. So. Um, I think it for their Kubernetes specifically, I think they would generally just consume <clears throat> reports. Um, so I don't know that they're going to be a good producer, but but that's okay. okay. We, need, we need more consumers too. Sure. So, um, yeah, absolutely. If they can leverage the CRD in any any manner, right, then that uh, it's a good use case. So and and not 
not knowing prior to today that we were going to have QBench. So QBench is obviously another consumer. So I would assume that that's going to be a very similar approach. No, KubeBench would actually produce uh, the policy report, right? So the idea would be that we would have a job which periodically runs KubeBench uh, for CIS compliance uh, on both the control plane and the worker oh, okay. nodes. Oh, sorry. And yes. then, right. Okay, sorry. I was, <laughs> I was thinking of KubeCuddle. Never mind. <laughs> right. Yeah, so KubeBench and Falco would both produce uh, yeah, reports periodically is the idea. Yeah, and it should be pretty interesting because that will bring get CIS compliance, you know, um, into all, all of those would be now available as reports, which we can then any upstream system, like whether it's, you know, cloud custodian or other systems can pick up and process. Right. And I think this dovetails to the white paper, you know, having a good example of, so maybe that's the end-to-end the -end flow is, is showing how CIS benchmark you know, a, a policy engine like Averno, and then something like a, a custodian consuming on the condition. Right. And so, yeah, the other, and that's maybe, you know, if we go to the, uh, what I started drafting for the policy management. And if you recall, we had one discussion with um, Liz, who was at, at that time with, um, with Aqua and she, Aqua Security, and she had mentioned, you know, what they were doing for one of their projects. Like they had also mentioned, um, you know, having covering like image image scanners, configuration checkers. Like you know, they were using Polaris, I believe, and then you know, runtime of course security. Like I've listed Falco here, but there could be others. So, and I put, you know, control plane security and worker node security with CIS benchmarks and KubeBench as the tool there. So there's some interesting set of things. And of course, now with supply chain security concerns as image signing is becoming more and more um, a hot topic of discussion. So we might wanna look at what's going on with notary and notary v2 and see if there's any interesting things there. Um, where does in total fit in that? Is that kind of a combination of scanner and signing? I don't know what that is. Uh, what does it do? Oh, in total? I, I, I think it's kind of a comprehensive supply chain. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what it does for. You I'll, know, I'll try to map it. I'll try to put it on there. Okay. All right, uh, but yeah, let's let's talk maybe then briefly. Unless there's anything else on the on on the CRD, we can switch to the white paper and. Um... I have one. Uh, uh, am I on mute? No, I have one one comment on the on the CRD. I'll mark it right now in red. We discussed okay. last time about the you know that hashing and source and you know to make sure that the policy that I use is the valid policy. So I added as part of the, uh, the, the policy uh, parameters, uh, we have category, we have severity and so on. I audit source and, and that can be the uh, 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 version in Git. So we are able to relate to that. So that will give me, we don't need to update anything in the metadata because once I have Git, I have the whole history, who updated it, who is the contact. So we don't need anything else besides that version. Uh, now, when we generate that, I'm not sure if uh, the, the policy, um, the, the, the check will have that visibility in the, in the policy version. I'm not sure if the policy comes already with that information to use it in result. So now you know better how to track that. But I think if we just keep the version, that, that should be enough, my, my two right. cents. Yeah, so certainly, you know, and I know, there was a brief discussion on um, also on Slack about this. Um, the question is, you know, yes, Git would be a best practice and certainly it makes sense to treat policy as code, but does that match the reality of what we see in a lot of enterprises? And, you know, so for the policy report, I think it would be good to have that option to, to have some fields where the, this could be added. The question is, do we want to, you know, can we make the assumption that it's always going to be Git versus something else? And 
uh, how do we, you know, how how much of a standard do we make it versus a free form field? Because the report is extensible. You could put things in the data field. Uh, I, I, agree. Stuff. I agree, Jim, but to be practical, if you look at, uh, you know, OPA and Kiverno, they both fit the model of, you know, policy as code in Git and will give us that. What would be other examples where the policy will not be present that way? And is that prevalent at all in our, in this context? Yeah, so even with OPA and Kiverno, I mean, certainly, yes, you can <laughs> store those in Git, but do you have to versus are you consuming them, you know, those libraries from like directly from like, say, for example, I don't know for sure, but I believe like Styra also, you know, sells like subscriptions and they can uh, release libraries, right? So the source may not necessarily be a Git repo that an enterprise ah, is managing. Ah, I see what you it mean. It could be I a see. vendor, right? Yes. So, we, we have we can have the, the source. So OSCAL today allows the source to be an um, href of that particular. Uh, sure. Right. So not necessarily uh, that. But I, what I think the point is that we need to have some kind of version to to associate the validity of the policy that we the result of the val, uh, of the of the check. Right. With the validity of the policy itself. So maybe a URI resource instead of a yeah. GitHub link per, per se. Yeah, and so, this covers everything because I can express even that in, in that fashion. Sure. Okay. And there's two fields we have already in each result, right? So the results um, can have a reference to a rule and to a policy. And they are free form, right? They're just text. So if you want to put right. a Git hash in there, you can. If you want to put a URL in there, you can. If you just want to identify names, you can do that, right? So we're not really mandating what goes in there because different engines may have different ways of managing it, but we have in the result like a policy and rule. And, you know, that's-, that's Right, I think the today. point, the point, Jim, is that if I need that in the result, I need that to be part of my policy input. So this means that it would be a requirement on the policy creation part to, have that field so the field is not present there i cannot use it at result so but we're not you know again we don't control the policy creation here right or how the policy is even declared or managed we're not trying to mandate that or standardize on that right so uh, i don't know how we would other than just having fields where a policy engine like here we say policy so we could, instead of saying name, we could just say is a name or ID of the policy, right? Just uh, so here we have assumed names, but we can clarify that in the text to say this could be a hyperlink, could be a git commit, however they want to reference the policy and rule. Just as a practical example, so we're talking about KubeBench, how does KubeBench define the CIS? Good question, right? So it would be this policy perhaps would be the CIS document number. The rule would be the, the you know, the like the XCDF. one dot whatever 12 dot something, right? You have the XCDF URI, yeah. So maybe we just, you know, add some examples in the description and, and broaden this description to say it doesn't have to be a name, could be some way of uniquely identifying the rule and the version. Um, and, and I guess the assumption here is policies are organized as a set of rules, but we can even change that if we want, right? And combine the two or keep two separate fields. Wouldn't it be helpful to have this as a nested structure? Um, you mean the policy, the rule inside the policy or? So if, um, yes, meaning if you have, um, if you specify the policy and the rule as a construct, and you can simply have a pointer to them, right? So that you can have any levels of nesting. Um, so if, if you want to basically simplify this at a very high level and say, here is the policy and here is the rule, I think this would perfectly work, right? But if you want to go down levels of complexity, like for example, how you would typically see things like PCI DSS laid out or NIST laid out, right? There is a hierarchy. 
uh, and they are not policies they are controls i'm not sort of saying the same but right. policies can be represented along the same lines as well right uh, we have uh, we have uh, the uh, uh, raj we have here a, a category so i think that okay. provides i think the the one level of nesting right so in if i'm looking at a, a cube right i have the five sections so i have the uh, control plane the worker node uh, etcd so those would be the categories and then we see in those right i have the, the various rules do we need more than than, than no, that? No, I, I, to be honest i don't fully understand this right and i i think i love to to be on i have not spent enough time on this as well and oh hopefully... i see no so, so we, we capture so the possibility right. to 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 group them through category right to reflect what's there but now i see we have both policy and rule uh, jim why do we need both typically yeah no, it's a this is marked as optional i think some prior discussion we felt that rule was also recommended but we could we could change this to okay uh, you know okay. either a single field or we could even actually thinking about it maybe control so did you in the maybe in the pr we do have control now it's a different it's level good. right it's a different level so uh, uh, if you think of the cube uh, bench right i have the the rules right the cis benchmarks are rules and then they are mapped to the cis controls so the control is an, another level of detail and nist controls and we decided that the policies themselves do not carry are control agnostic i just check them and there is another entity that will have the uh knowledge of what maps to what that's right okay all right, so yeah, let's let's decide on that, and you know we can uh, streamline if we want to combine into one field. That may be good too. Um, yeah, but I don't see, I don't think we changed anything there. It's still policy and rule from the, in the latest commit. But if we want to, we can, you know, again combine these two and have expand on the text to, you know detail that there there's you know other options you could add over here yeah um one more question uh so as oscar evolves and becomes more and more we do not have a requirement here to align with fedram right or or anything we we uh no. stay generic okay yeah there's no requirement on that Okay, so maybe what we should do, uh, you know, Anka and Robert, if you want, we can, uh, you know, set up a separate working section just to finish up on the CRD. And, you know, like if we do that either later this week or early next week, I think it'd be good to complete this and get it merged in because there's just a few things pending and we probably just need a 30 minutes or hour focus time on this. Sounds, sounds good. Okay, so let me propose. Can you some add time me to soon. the meeting as well, please? Sure, Raj. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. So let's do that, and you know, I'll propose some times, and we can get that done. And then, so the next thing, um, you know, I do want to. We have just ten minutes left, but just to kind of introduce, um, you know, so in our last meeting, we talked about potentially, you know, doing this white paper, and we were just discussing that earlier too. So I did send out a draft and I think I immediately got stuck on, okay, what is the, so it's not a draft for a white paper, it's a draft for the proposal to a white paper. And uh, it's more about, okay, like us defining who's the audience. Uh, and, you know, my main question was, is it a practitioner like a Kubernetes admin or is it a, you know, higher level stakeholder like a CIO or um, CXO? Cause those would be very different papers. Um, and I just pasted what they did in the cloud native security white paper and they've kept it very broad. Um, and then, you know, like the next scope, and this goes to your question earlier, Robert, do we want to start with Kubernetes or do we want to go immediately for the whole cloud native ecosystem, right? And then the only other thing I did so far was I tried to categorize some of the known tools and areas, right? So the policy concerns would be like, these would be the different categories. And then in those, like we have these standards, like, or some reference, like here we have CIS benchmarks and the tool is KubeBench. For container images, there's a bunch of image scanners like Claire and Trivi and others. 
uh, image signing, yeah, we'll have to research this more. And then for configuration management, there's OPA, Gatekeeper, Kiberno, Polaris, which seems to do only scans, not, not admission control. Uh, so we can kind of decide on that. And then runtime, Falco, and there's probably a few other tools emerging in that area. So anyways, we need to decide in real left if you're, the question is, do we want to, you know, even talk about specific tools? Cause you know, there would be the challenge of, we don't want to give preference to one tool versus another, but it's nice to know what's available and what fits where. Uh, so there is value for our users, right? But we don't want to kind of uh, seem biased in any official publication. Um, so I think those are concerns to address and think about. So I would strongly recommend if, if, if you haven't, please take a look at the Cloud Native Security White Paper, a look at the process that they followed, and we need to decide on what we do here. The first question is, who's this paper for and what should we cover? So Jim, um, I think uh, just my two cents, I think making it generic cloud native may make it difficult for people to understand, right? Again, when I say people, because for example, um, there, is a, there is a working group in Cloud Security Alliance that focuses on, let's say, continuous audit metrics, which is a very similar charter to what we are talking about here, right? But they look at it much more, their, their purview is very, very different, right? I mean, they, they look at this much more holistically at a cloud solutions provider and based on their uh, STAR certification. So I think it would be very helpful to sort of talk about this at the Kubernetes level first, before you start expanding it out, because it's a vast area by itself, right? And, and you don't want to get lost. That, that would be my two cents. The question I want to ask you is that, so the process today is that if there are multiple of these providers um, who can uh, who can provide these policy statements, right? That you're going to aggregate and we're going to present this part of the policy CRD. Is there, do they, do they have to register? How do they, for example, how do you differentiate between a policy statement that is produced by Cubebench versus Kuberno versus Notary versus Trivi? There are a bunch of things, Anchor, Clare, right? So on and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. There could be hundreds of them. So how right. do we, what role do we play is that, do they have to simply register to say that we are going to produce these policy reports and is there a mechanism to do that? No, so there's no central registry or anything like that. They would just have to incorporate the policy report as part of their tool chain and either through an adapter or native support of reports, right? So all of these tools are reporting in some format today. The question is if they're running in Kubernetes, do they want to adopt this uh, reporting structure or come up with their own. And a lot of tools today have their own independent structure, right? Like Kubebench produces JSON, can produce text reports, uh, things like that. What we're saying is if it's running in Kubernetes, it makes a lot of sense to produce uh, a CR, a custom resource, which can be then looked at through kubectl and other Kubernetes tools. Yeah. Right, so it would be up to each tool to, you know, either ad adapt or adopt somehow. That's that's kind of why I saw the white paper as or the position paper or whatever we want to call it as kind of taking a step back from the how, and more looking at kind of top down like the why, and then what am I trying to accomplish with all this, right? Because otherwise it's easy to get lost in the in the details of exactly how we hook up all the technology parts. But I thought this was kind of a good chance to come up for air and explain it to kind of like, you know, someone. So maybe the audience isn't the CXO, but maybe it's the person writing the, the report for the CXO. So it's like, why should we do any of this? Right. right. So ha having them see a cross cut of how all of this works together to deliver some value and what is that value? Okay. Monetary, security, whatever we define value to be. Just understanding how the how all the parts would work and what the use cases are and what what I get at the end of it. 
if I bother to read all this documentation, install all these tools, what, what do I get at the end of it? Mm -hmm. And in the, in the very narrow scope of policy enforcement, and right. I, think, I think we can all assume for now security policy enforcement or compliance policy enforcement, if we want to expand a little bit. Okay. Yeah, and, and Raj, I agree with your point on the scope. I was thinking along much the same lines to say, okay, what could be something tangible? And like, let's say if we were to say we want to get something published in three months, right? Uh, taking on CNCF just seems like a fairly ambitious mm -hmm. yeah. endeavor in three months or in a quarter. Uh, but if we focus on Kubernetes and describe, you know, what is... Kubernetes policies, like we can start with some list of categories, uh, give sample tools uh, based on cert for certain date and time and say, this is what we know of in the landscape. Um, but then um, also talk about where the report fits, how policy engines can leverage it. We can, we can go into more details around that if we just focus on Kubernetes. And Robert, Anka, do you agree? I think it has to be rooted in Kubernetes. I mean, as a substrate for how policy, I mean, we're implementing this for Kubernetes. That said, I think, you know, the IBM tools, you know, Cloud Custodian, all these have a, a more right. holistic view of the enterprise. So, I mean, I think it's an. I think we can be clear that this that Kubernetes is a concrete instantiation of everything we're talking about, but that the design pattern should hold no matter no matter what. Okay. All right. So let's you know we'll start next uh, in two weeks' time. We'll just start the session by discussing. So add your comments, add thoughts to the. Uh, to this document and we can just use it as a working document to capture what we want to do and then come up with the proposal um, you know that we can uh, I guess advertise with various SIGs and start you know assigning folks to different sections of the write-up then. Uh, do you include the OSCAL part as well Jim? I did not get a chance to look at all of the document. I can take care of the OSCAL section. Yeah, we can certainly, when we talk about the policy report and how it fits, how it could be used, it would be nice to show that, you know, the report uh, is today targeted to be generic, but with the intent of being able to map it to OSCAL, um, so we can show that upper level mapping tool, like perhaps, you know, the open compliance uh, agent and other things that uh, we've talked about. Okay. Exactly. Yes, but in I mean, the implementation itself, we plan to expose the API for OSCAL as well, right? I, that, that. What do you mean, like the implementation of what? So we will have we will have a library that will translate that into, let's say that we will store uh, the OSCAL file on a config map, right? Do we plan also to expose an API? No, so that would be... so. We would publish the CRD, right? And then tools would write, or we would, you know, kind of sponsor writing adapters for various tools within CNCF. But then the mapping, we have not committed to saying that we would, you know, write some implementation to map that to OSCAL. It would be up to like the, you know, other operators or other tools to do that. We could probably have another, you know, if we want to document some more details on that mapping we can, but that's not something. Yeah. And, and so that's why I say like, okay, I think custodian could be good first example of that because as a consumer of the policy report and then a producer of general compliance output report, right. that's where exporting uh -huh. that as OSCAL is a, is a meaningful thing. So right. custodian where... will, will have logic for, for compliance as well, NIST, HIPAA and so on. Uh, today it doesn't, and I think that that's a problem. Is it? It doesn't have any definition of mapping it to any particular framework. Right, right. Well, the my goal. PR, the PR. I'm, the sorry, 
my, my goal was to expose natively the, the OSCAL, right? So the, the, we, we uh, have right now the, um, that, I don't know, it's JSON or, right, in, in, uh, with the fields that we have uh, available and, you know, to have the, the uh, similar, uh, um, a similar uh, observation, right, in the format of, of OSCAL. Right to have two two available. Uh, I, I so I kind of thought that the goal was to align the JSON with a compatibility with OSCAL so that a downstream or upstream I don't know where in the stream <laughs> somewhere in the stream someone could consume the policy report, and that's where the code would be to produce the the OSCAL. And I'm just saying that that to me the house for that seems to be like custodian. Um, as one example, mm -hmm. it consume right. the output from the policy report, and then in its code, generate OSCAL, JSON, XML, YAML. Uh, how, how does the user fetch today the uh, result via the CRD API? No, they yeah, would yeah. use kubectl or other native tools, right? And Kubernetes. Oh, no, no. But you would use like Python, for example, like because custodian is Python. You would use the Kubernetes. I forget the exact package name, but the Python wrapper for the Kubernetes API. There's a sure. custom resource, get custom resource, list custom resource. I forget the exact name, but I would call Python to get custom resource and pass in the the name of the policy CRD, uh, and then get all of those fields from that Python API. And okay. It's gonna it's going to call but, the... But I, I think Anka has a good point. I think the point here is that, and this need not be part of the CRD, and I think that's what we are discussing. But it has to be an helper function, right? That map, somebody has to be able to visualize the output of the policy CRD to something tangible. And I think what I'm hearing is that what she's saying is something tangible is the OSCAL format. So uh, I would not agree with that because I think it's tangible depends on who's consuming it, right? Because... Tangible for a Kubernetes admin would be, you know, what they do right. through kubectl, and they can see that. I think that's, tangible that's, for. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry just, go ahead, Yeah, just because what what kind of gave me some clarity, Raj? Oh, is that... sorry, I'll have to leave. I, I leave the call at twelve. I'm sorry, guys. No problem. No problem. Okay. Okay. Um, what gave me clarity, Raj, is I was looking at exactly this. Like, how do I get access to this? The, the reality is by being the custom resource and exposing that to Kubernetes as a custom resource, you already get all the benefits of a concrete data element. You get access via the Kubernetes API. You don't have to write anything special. Because like when I first went in, this was like, okay, what do I have to write to, you know, do I have to write a controller? Do I have to implement something to get this fancy new custom resource? The answer is no, because that's, that's the benefit of inheriting all of that from Kubernetes itself. I'm with so, you. I'm not so disagreeing all, with that. All I need to do is consume via that API and then do something with that data. And right. And that would be some other tool can, you know, it could be an operator like the, you know, IBM open compliance operator, could be cloud custodian, any other tool that wants to use the Kubernetes API and uh, produce that mapping, they're free to do that. That's right. That's right. And, and I wouldn't write a library that you know, natively spits out OSCAL because there are libraries that other people have written, most, namely NIST, who manages OSCAL. No, no, I want to be very clear. That's not what I said. I am not saying that the output should be in an OSCAL format. That's not at all what I'm saying. I think what I heard was that, I think which is what Jim was saying, is that maybe we should sponsor some helper functions, right? For people, I think the core of what we are discussing in terms of the CRD scope is perfectly fine. I, I, I don't think there is any disagreement. I think the question is, once you have the CRD output, should we take the extra step of writing, a, showing a helper function on how it maps to OSCAL or not? I think that was the, at least the way that I interpreted Anka's question. Uh, I, I guess I kind of, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Let, let, let's, uh, I'll, I'll take a first stab at the, the code okay. to do that. And let's see if there's enough there. I, I'm just assuming that that's like, you know, I mean, I guess not to trivialize it too much, but that's like, you know, 10 lines of code. So maybe that's a helper function. If someone wants to abstract that into something, um, you know, more generic like an SDK, but I, it just kind of seems like I'm taking one form of JSON and stuffing it into a different form of JSON. So it's kind of just like 
it's almost, it's almost like rewriting JQ, <laughs> but um, you know, writing a, J, a JQ query and, and you know, rearranging JSON formats. That's so maybe I mean as a helper function there, sure. But I don't know that it's specific to this policy report. You, the Probably. same could be said for any custom resource. But yeah, the proof is in the pudding. Let me let me show some code, and then I think maybe that'll motivate. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. All right, folks. I know we're over time. Uh, thank you. Take care. All right. Thanks.